So last night I went to another person live thing, like the Quentin Tarantino thing, right? Person live. The person live on yeah. stage talking about the book they've written, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, obviously it was, it'd be a hard act to follow the Quentin experience. because we, we didn't know, know we, we went to go see Quentin Tarantino yeah. live. Go, go a few weeks back and listen to the whole experience with that because it was a great time. Great right? time. Anyway, I booked a solo ticket to go and see Bob Odenkirk oh, on stage. Oh, yes, I remember you saying, right. yeah. And, you know, I'm a big fan of medical sort, as we know. Yeah. And uh, I like Bob Odenkirk as an actor and as a, as a creative talent. So I thought, yeah, I'm going to go to this. I'm going to do that. Get my mm. free copy of the book and stuff. Anyway, I went to that last night. And obviously, it was perfectly good and stuff. And obviously, you can't compare to the Quentin thing. No. And it, was, it was fine. Venue? You know, Palladium, again. Okay, big. And uh, Bob Odenkirk was great. Good. Um, some bits didn't land. And, and uh, some of it was a bit too relaxed. Not sure that was all his fault, but the whole sort of arrangement. Right. The guy... Com- comparing it with him was Martin Freeman, which was nice okay. to have Martin Freeman on stage. Yeah. But it was weird that like, Bob Odenkirk is the guest, right? Yeah. Bob Odenkirk does, announces himself. Oh yeah, comes I've always stage. found it weird when comedy acts do that. And he comes on stage and then he's like, oh, Martin Freeman's here. And then Martin Freeman comes on like he's the guest. And then Martin Freeman's like, so what do, what do you want me to do now? And it felt like really? someone had dropped out and they got Martin Freeman in last minute. Wow. So I did have a nice time, but it, but it was just much more, the Quentin experience was... Polished, I felt right. like when we were walking in to get our seats, there was this palpable scent to see Quentin Tarantino. There was this real like build up palpable sense oh, yeah. that we we're about to see something amazing. It was like yeah. Christian Bale was going to walk on and do magic. Yes. Right. From the prestige, <laughs> yeah. like the Tesla coils are going to start firing. Yeah. It wasn't. But do you know what I mean? It was a real buzz. Totally. Was there a buzz? For... There, was, there, was a, there was a mild buzz. And I mean, the fact is, I love Bob Odenkirk as much yeah. as I do. I think... I think he would admit that he is not, he does not bring the same energy as Quentin Tarantino. I really want to see Nobody. I've heard lots of people say Well, that's what I might watch because he talked about that, you know, doing that in his 50s. And and he spoke about how he had his heart attack uh, because, you know, he he had a very like near fatal experience. And he actually spoke about how if you watch Better Call Saul, the final season, there's a scene because they had to keep some of the footage where in the first half of a scene, he said, you're watching a man hours away from near death. And in the second half of that scene, you're watching a man who six weeks afterwards has a, has a new lease of life. So that scene, it, a half that shot. Scene, half, so, so half of that scene at the beginning wow. is Bob Odenkirk half an hour, an hour away from having a massive heart attack. And then the, the, the second half of the scene, I can't believe he was back on set five, six weeks later, yeah. is him with a new lease of life. Anyway, the reason I bring it up though is because um, they were talking about many things, but they talked, one big thing that they talked about a lot is Bob Odenkirk is, is, is comedy, you know, and like mm. he did that thing that Americans love to do. And this isn't a criticism necessarily because it was fine in this context, which is valorize stand-up comedy and sketch yeah. comedy. They, they, they much, they love to kiss the altar and kiss the ring of comedy more yeah. than I think British people. Comic uh, clubs, British, they're, dropping, they're, they're, gigging. The comic culture, I think is so much more of a thing. It, sorry, Britain has a comedy culture, but, yeah. but I mean more, you find Americans more talking about the, the history of comedy and like, oh, I remember going to see that guy 40 years ago. In he was 80s, coming up. Man. Yeah, was, yeah, listen to any Mark Maron it podcast. A time. And it's like, yeah, the fucking clubs, man. I oh. saw CK there when he was uh, a kid. Boba. Burnham's impression of Joe Rogan talking about comedy. Right. And yeah, yeah. man, they would just kill, bro. Yeah, you yeah. Sam Kissinger back in the 80s, yeah. man, bro. They didn't give a fuck. Yeah, exactly. Bro. Right. Yeah. Um, but 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 it was very interesting. And, and, and Bob Odenkirk was a writer on SNL. I didn't realize him when he was 25, and he actually wrote some pretty famous yeah. sketches that did pretty well. Um, and he talks about this very uh I, I was unfamiliar with this. Apparently, there is a legendary time. This is now, it's become like a, a thing of, of, of myth mm. now that um, Steven Seagal hosted Saturday Night Live. And it was, no, it is now known as one of the worst Saturday Night Live hosts and one of the worst moments in television mm. ever to happen to the point that you can't see it now. There's no record of it online. You cannot find it. And this story came up because Bob Odenkirk and Martin Freeman know each other because they did the TV sh- series of Fargo 10 years ago. Yeah. Right? And he told the story that Jason Sudeikis had a copy of the Segal tape that kind of does the rounds between SNL members of staff. You know, it's like this, if you, if you, you get into the club, you can have you can this. Have a watch, yeah. So Jason Sudeikis gave Bob Odenkirk this, this disc of um, Steven Segal doing SNL and Martin Freeman him watched it. And the way they described it, it just sounded like just, just a walking disaster. Yeah. And Bob Odenkirk talks about trying to tell Steven Segal how to not only act, but like understand what comedy was. And, and uh, you know, Bob Odenkirk <laughs> saying, he's like, work. you know, and I was talking to this 
mass of cells that I think was a human. <laughs> this this it. wooden block on a stage. He's like, have you ever talked to a rock? That's what talking, and they spoke about, I mean, I wouldn't do it justice at all, but the, the whole end of that episode of SNL, uh, Steven Seagal had this idea to basically do an action movie in four minutes. But, but I, and Bob Odenkirk was like, as I tell this, it sounds like there's a comedy sketch in there. And congratulations if you find it. But like, and what, what was great is of course, Martin Freeman was agreeing with him. He was like, oh yeah, you just have to believe it. And I really want to see that, that yeah. DVD now. I want to make it into the club rub someone up the right way so they can say, oh, George, come over. I'll show you this. I'll show you this Steven Seagal tape. I have a really weird Steven Seagal story that I cannot tell on the podcast, but I may have told you before, but I can't, I can't possibly say, I, I won't even mention him? it. Huh? You no, him? it's, it's better than that. <laughs> but I can't tell it on the podcast. I'll tell you after. Oh my God. Yeah. I know the story. <laughs> I, we can't, I, no, you cannot know, tell, I can't tell story, that story, but, but he's a weird, fantastic. weird man who has we been would, many different places. We would be so, <laughs> to the end no, of our lives. But I will tell, if this podcast is still going in like 15 years, I'll tell that Steve yes, Scott yeah, story. When we're lawyered up. <laughs> yeah. That, yeah, that is a good story. Yeah, and so protected by immeasurable wealth. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, yes. that's really mean, but. No, but that's it. We, we haven't said anything. We just, we know. I will just like to follow up with some uh, AOB, some any other business mm. from, from uh, Housekeeping. last week. Housekeeping from last week, because what often happens is mm. we do the show, we talk about stuff, we do the emails, and we've got so many things running through our minds as we do this show. We've yeah. got, we got better at keeping things in, but like you and I will finish, we'll go away, and a day or two days later, we'll go, oh, fuck. Oh, that no, thing. Yeah. And there's just things just gather up. It's like when you have an argument and you're like, I should have fucking, should said, have fucking that. said that. So um, first of all, and thank you to a couple of listeners who wrote in either on Instagram or, e or email or commented on YouTube to point this out. But the, the scene I had in my head yes, last week- I saw the, this, yeah. With the guy trying to microwave his nuts because yes. he didn't want to have uh, uh, children was of course Dwight in the US office when Angela's trying to contractually oblige him to procreate. He goes into the break room and he just st stands and puts the microwave on his crotch. Really funny, it's great. And it's annoying because we talked about the US office last week. Mm. I can't believe we didn't click that. Um, I was just saying to this to you before we recorded, but we played that game last week about um, name ten movies about, named after the main character, right? Yes, yeah, <laughs> and which, which the, did really well. Yeah, it did well, which on, is great. Did, did well on socials, which we're happy about. And obviously, I could only name a few in a thirty seconds. And also, yeah, in thirty seconds, your brain does not function yeah. as if it does, and, even and when you're not under pressure. You know, and I obviously I thought it was implied, but obviously you can't say Batman, Superman, etc. Because yeah. that those aren't those people's names. Bruce, maybe we'd have Bruce to call Banner, Bruce Banner. Yeah, Banner. But yeah. the movie's not called Bruce, Bruce, Bruce Wayne. Yeah. Sorry, Bruce Wayne, not Bruce. Yeah, Banner. sorry, Bruce yeah. Wayne. Um, just uh, accepting the <laughs> comments yeah. coming. But the comments on these videos, guys, I don't know how many hundreds of people commented this, but they were like, "Can't believe you didn't say James Bond." Can't what, believe, what James Bond there's movie? There's not is a called, movie called James Bond. Because when I looked at the comments, there were so like normally like way more than we usually have. And I thought, oh my god, when you look at it, there are so many movies. People yeah. were like Shrek, Aladdin, yes. just went on like all the Harry Potters. If yeah. you wanted to be boring and answer yeah. it that way, but then they were like just answering stuff that wasn't yeah. at all a thing, and they would just go, uh, yeah, like all those ones. James like, Bond. That's not no. That's not no. A thing. yeah. I think someone said Power Rangers at one point, and I was like, <laughs> that's not, that's not that's a name. Not, that's not a name. That's not the, that's not the people's names. Anyway, that was a bit of an annoying bit of housekeeping. And last of all, I don't think those people listen to the full. No, of course so, they don't. They're not. Our, they're fine. not the pulpets or no, the kitchenettes or whatever we're going for. What are we? Guys, I think, if you're listening, you're the core. You are the core. You you're are the, the core group. Like. Welcome. Um, and last of all, uh, an email last week, or might have been the week before, asked us about best guest appearances mm, okay, in TV on. shows. Yeah. Oh, that, yeah, that was it. It was last week because they were talking about James Spader in the office. Uh, I don't have a, 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 a dedicated answer, but if anyone's ever watched Broad City, did you watch Broad City? Yeah, I've seen like not all, all of, of it? it. I've seen most of it. Yeah, I binged that in early 21 lockdown. Yeah. And I, it was fine, but the more I watched it, the less I liked it, the less funny it got, I think. It's better if you were high. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Do you, did you, I just found, it got to the point where I was like, you two would never be friends. Because yeah. one, one of you, Abby's like, uh, I, I sympathize with and like- I, I find Abby funnier and more tragic than Alana. Alana is not a real person. No, Alana is- she's completely unhinged. And, yeah. and just People so- People like, like, Alana's the funny one. I'm like, no, no like, she's Abby, not. I don't Abby's want an episode. I don't want to watch an episode about Alana shaving her feet into a <laughs> bottle of, oh. Anyway, I digress. But what amazed me about Broad City for you know, a small show that was you know, set in New York and stuff is the amount of cameos yes, from were, every single, I'm talking like big 
A-listers yeah. turning up playing homeless people. Do yeah. you know Steve Buscemi, Melissa Leo? Uh, I mean that. Yeah, it's kind of it, it's, so it's kind of actors you people. ask for favors. Hey, I'm doing this really like quirky off the wall yeah. comedy. Whoopi Goldberg. We're in New yeah. York, like just a day filming. Do you mind? It's one of those kind of things. Yeah, but I was like, holy shit! There's like, if so, if you want uh, a load of famous people to turn up in cameos, Broad City is yeah. the one. There are a couple of good episodes of Broad City, I will say. The one where they have to get to the wedding and it's like all the trains are cancelled, you know, and like mm. they're running from Penn Station to to yes, to like, yeah, I remember, anyway, yeah. anyway, good stuff. That is my any other business. And also, James didn't know what AOB meant. No, I to, I was, he was like- That's well, how I know you're a freelancer. Yeah, yeah, and I, I don't work know in the corporate, corporate, corporate lingo yeah. doesn't, I mean, I know some of it, but AOB, I was like- What's AOB? Area of the building? <laughs> 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 Area of outstanding beauty? <laughs> I could have Googled it, but I just went AOB question mark. <laughs> no, that's fine, that's fine. Anyway, let's get on with talking about some films. So- uh, Episode 73, welcome. Welcome to episode 73. Big, big numbers, as we've said before. and. This week, I've had a chance to see some films. Yes. Because I've had a few weeks off, so... Looking and forward to your thoughts. So, without further ado, here come some film reviews. So, George, one of the films you managed to watch this week was Evil Dead Rise. Yes. And if you've been listening to the show, if you're a regular listener, you'll know that George watched for the first time the original Evil Dead 2. Mm -hmm. Yes. I have not seen any of these films, yes. but Evil Dead Rise is definitely attracting me. I'm seeing a lot of buzz about it mm -hmm. on social media, particularly for its, well, it's a modern uh, retelling of this story. It's rebooting it, but also for, you know, the brave moves that it's taking. And this, I'm hearing a lot about how gory, disgusting, mm -hmm. boundary pushing mm -hmm. this is. Kind of a lot of the ways Evil Dead was at its mm -hmm. time. But George, you have seen it. Tell me more. Okay, so Evil Dead Rise. So uh, as James said, uh, Evil Dead originally a series of three films from the uh, late 70s through to the early mm. 90s of Evil Dead, Evil Dead 2, like eight years later, mm -hmm. and then Army of Darkness afterwards. For yes. just a bit of context about Evil Dead, they were made for like £4.50 um, <laughs> by Sam Raimi and Bruce Campbell in that time. And, you know, they, they were shoestring budget, but horror, comedy, freaky, zany, squelchy, squishy, odd... Mm. tight bad taste, horror, horror bad taste exactly camp uh horror tales um from that and evil dead 2 essentially remade and it is both a remake of and a sequel to evil dead 1 so in evil dead 2 they basically do the first one in the first 15 minutes um i rewatched it recently you can go back and listen to when i what i did i thought it was a blast I had a great time it's a huge blind spot i filled in and i I, we, I watched it with the same friends who i went to see this with nice and we had a great, just a huge amount of fun. It's not scary, but it's freaky, you know, it's, it, and it, it's, it's effective. And it's amazing that a film made on such a low budget, such a long time ago, can still elicit such a response, which is great. And so here comes now, 30 plus years later, Evil Dead Rise. Can I just say before you jump in, when I saw the trailer for Evil Dead Rise, I didn't immediately, even though I hadn't seen the original Evil Dead, connect that immediately yeah. to Evil Dead. And that's, and that's okay. Because from think... the trailer, at least from my perspective, yes. they didn't look like they were that bound this is not, in tone yeah. and, and voice. This but, yeah. is not a sequel to, it is a reboot of the franchise, and it's not a remake of either of the original. It's taking it into new territory. I'm absolutely fine with that. That's okay. Um, there was a, a remake ish in 2013, I think, last yeah. year, you know, or 2010. Um, this has got nothing to do with that. It's a new franchise they're trying to Horror set up. Horror films, right? man. You got to like only count certain reboots and certain sequels, and there's non true you need sequels. An accountant it, it's to it really a spreadsheet to know which one it is. Anyways, Evil Dead Rise. So, uh, as you say, James, it's doing very well at the box office. It's, yeah. it's getting a lot of good reaction and response. What's the story of Evil Dead Rise? Well, uh, essentially, I mean, I'll read the uh, synopsis that's on uh, online. A reunion between two estranged sisters gets cut short by the rise of a flesh-possessing demon, thrusting them into a primal battle for survival as they face the most nightmarish version of family imaginable. So, yeah, you've got uh, Beth, who's... Uh, these two sisters in their 30s. Beth, she's a guitar technician who flies back home to her sister's family, where her sister lives with her three children uh, in a... Uh, sorry, <clears throat> in a abandoned building that is falling apart and getting repossessed. Most, most of the flats are empty. There's a storm outside. It's very sort of horror-filled. Mm -hmm. And uh, Beth, who's the guitar technician, is pregnant, and uh, she's just found out. And uh, Ellie, is, uh, who's got the three children, her husband's left her, and they haven't really spoken, and they're there, they're, they have this sort of chat. The film opens, actually, separately. It begins in the forest, in a cabin, 
by the lake, and you're like, great. I mean, Evil right. Dead Terror, Evil Dead Territory, yeah. which is how the, the original is. And uh, the first ten minutes, uh, very serviceable. Uh, in terms of this film and then you cut and it says one day earlier <gasps> one day earlier mm. oh in media res okay mm. and we're going back to this completely different story with different characters um and yes uh so the the sisters are there during this storm during this build um, they, they, you know they're in this dilapidated building um uh the kids go out they're downstairs in the car park there's a huge earthquake and also can i say i, I mean this isn't a spoiler but like this does actually take quite a while it does take its time to happen. This is okay. a 90-minute movie. It takes its sweet-ass time to get there. Earthquake happens. Um, a hole opens up in the car park floor. Danny, the son, uh, pops down, has a look in there. There's an old abandoned bank vault and an altar and with, with a religious iconography. What does he find? He finds in the altar, in the hole that's been ruptured by the earthquake, the Book of the Dead, mm. which is the thing from Evil Dead. Yes. Anyone else. And what does he do with the book? He takes it and he brings about a cup upstairs. Never to the flat. read from a book. Exactly. It's the mummy told us anything. That's why I don't read. I don't <laughs> read nothing. No book of the dead for me. Uh, uh, uh. Anyway, brings it upstairs. I mean, much of this is in the trailer. Things get read out loud. In incantations get happened. Mm. And certain members of the family get possessed. Mm. That's the premise of Evil Dead. Um, so I'll begin by saying that the good, th the good stuff is that, you know, Evil Dead Rise... 18 certificate. We love it when a film commits to being. Probably it looks incredibly gruesome, incredibly gory, really? and uh, squishy, and all that kind of stuff. See lots like squelching eggs and. Uh, yes, and there's a bit. There's a bit with a. Oh, there's a bit with a kitchen utensil that I won't spoil. That had me go. Oh, Jesus. Christ, like that really, really uh, uh, maybe made my, my uh, teeth sound edge. Um, there's some great moments with a uh, shot through the, the eye hole of a door looking at a hallway. Um, I think the, the, the Ellie, who's the mother who gets possessed is, is very committed and it's great. And um, you know, there's some playful modernizations of the film begins with the, the spirit. The, the Evil Dead has the spirit. You never see the spirit, but it's mm. POV yes. rushing through it's them. Famous, the very yeah. famous. And that's kind of played on at the beginning. And, and that's great. And I think, you know, if, you go, if you're going for horror moments, if you're going for blood and vomit and all that kind of uh, stuff, you'll get it. Yeah. My thing with Evil Dead Rise is it's a bit of a shame because I've, I've seen lots of positive things about it. I don't know how helpful it, it is that how recently I've seen Evil Dead 2. I will say that. Okay. Because when I watched Evil Dead Rise, which is only 93, 96 minute film, right? Mm -hmm. I couldn't help but think that this is fine. But this, unlike the spunky, energetic pluckiness of the originals... I couldn't help but feel that this felt very top-down, studio-sanctioned scariness. Mm. That the, the longer it went on, the more generic it felt. Is it scary? No. You described it as grotesque. And not it's, gro it's gruesome, yeah. but it's not scary, no. Yeah. It's, it's beats and the way it performs itself is just very familiar to any modern horror film, actually, mm. which is a shame. Yeah. Because The Evil Dead is such a spicy... Uh, in green, such a spicy IP, so freaky, so potent. I, I I think the film really doesn't know how much to lean into that or not. Now, I'm not saying that I need the film to be a carbon copy of the original. I'm not saying it needs to be bound by the original, but it's more that it, it doesn't almost seem to understand how much it wants to be an Evil Dead movie. Mm. So that's what I mean. If you if you go into this and think I, I it's a if you took Evil Dead off the title, it's fine. It's okay, but it's it's it, it, it's a bit slow, um, and I like some other issues I get onto. But if you start calling it an Evil Dead movie, I think anyone with the vaguest familiarity familiarity with those other films will be disappointed because you just get a very, like I said, studio sanctioned, uh, generic possession film. Mm. It's just I, I, halfway through, I was just like, I could just be watching any Exorcist film right now. Mm. Anything. There's which nothing. There, which in the last uh, fifteen years that have been uh, so huge, of course. Many. And um, I think I, 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 the, the biggest issue with me with that kind of um, over generic studio sanctionedness is, is is the pacing. And the pacing I found just so annoying. I'm not talking about the way it kind of barrels through. That's fine. I mean, if anyone's seen Evil Dead Two, it just like races on. That's. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about how any time there is action or when the film really clicks into gear in this setting, I should say that the whole film is basically in this apartment block in the same way that you, you, you'd sw you've switched a isolated cabin in the woods mm. for a dilapidated apartment building. And that is where the film is set. So it, it's a restrained setting. But by doing that... Um, 
Uh, but by doing that, they, you know, you you want there to be uh, the action to be quick and relentless and, and like mm. to kick into gear. So, and when, you know, there's a lot of buildup as there should be in a horror film, but when like the moments happen, every single moment of action or every single scare is cut in half and slowed down to be quiet, quiet, bang. Yeah. Quiet, quiet, bang. And it, it was like hearing the same joke over and over again. Quiet, quiet, bang is the thing that Mark Kermode's pointed out about no, how know, yeah. one horror works. But like, you'll have a thing where like, something uh there's a moment where they, they put the mother in the bathtub because she's burning up and they don't know what's wrong with her and then like the bubbles start to go a bit crazy so everyone stands back and looks at the bubbles and then it goes duh, duh, duh. actually then she reaches and she jumps up on the ceiling and it's like uh, and then they just stand still and they look at her wait for the trailer shot get the trailer shot and it goes she goes down to the bathtub and you go oh great now it's gonna kick off no same thing again quiet quiet wait for her to emerge and and that is how every single moment of action or energy or drama is shot in this entire film. And mm. I was I was like, yeah, and then there's gonna be a bit where she's gonna have him pinned or have anyone pinned on the ground and they're gonna do something, but she'll hesitate to be freaky, give a freaky smile, which will give enough time for the other character to do something. And it just felt very familiar, um, uh, not bad. It, I, I, yeah. I, I do think if you're really into this stuff, there's enough to, to get by with, but it's just like for, 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 for a franchise that is so inventive and so freaky, so weird. I was so disappointed at how generic it was. Um, and that pacing really did bother me because it, 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 it ran through every set piece. That was. Do, do, do you know what I mean? Do you yeah, understand? Yeah, like yeah. Uh, the, the action, cutting the action in every way. You could, there's a fight scene in a kitchen, right? Yeah. And I was, I was like, let's go for it. But every single, every two seconds, the fighting would stop for the person to look at the scary thing. The scary thing's kind of like, ha <laughs> And then it's a resume and then stop. And like, oh, I kept felt the momentum stopping. And like, it reminds me of um, A Quiet Place, where, which is not a horror film, I know, not, by, not really. But I but, you've got kudos for it. Yeah. Absolutely. But the middle section of A Quiet Place, I remember just being absolutely relentless. You know, it's, yeah. it's isolated to the farm, single location. Yeah. And it's like, you've got to get the thing that's over there, but then something's making a noise over yeah. here. And then the great- Baby's thinking, coming. <laughs> yeah, a, a baby's coming. Don't step on the nail. Oh, the thing, God. And it's- so stressful. Mm. There's none of that. And it, it, it cuts its momentum and its tension. And so often I found really, really annoying because, uh, and, and boring. And towards the end, they, they keep trying to do the odd freaky joke, the moment of humor. And I found myself just getting less and less out of it because I, I, I was, became less certain of what the film was wanting to do. Mm. When, when it was trying to be funny, I was like, but I don't know if you do want to be funny. I can't tell if you're trying to scare me because I don't know because I felt the film was indecisive about whether it, how much of an Evil Dead film it wanted to be. I mean, do you know what was weird, really weird? With, of, of the four of us that saw it, we were really split down the middle. My, yeah, my two, I've heard yeah, positive reviews. My, my two friends I saw it with thought it was a tight 90 minute, good amount of gore and stuff. But me and my other friend, we thought the same thing. Generic, flaccid, not entertaining really. Just, just, if you've seen a modern horror film, you've kind of seen this other stuff just with added blood, mm. right? So it got me also thinking recently about, um, it reminded me when we talked about Scream 6 about a month ago, yeah. right? They are actually an interesting comparison because they're both belated sequel reboots mm -hmm. to an established horror franchise and a, and a horror franchise that is smart and witty and playful. And... Scream 6 worked, which is not perfect. It's not that, you know, it's not that good. But like Scream 6 had a much better understanding of what a Scream film should be, of what that franchise should be. And I remember that first 15 minutes of Scream 6 being like, okay, get, these guys get it. They know what a Scream film is. I'm in safe hands. But just throughout Evil Dead, I just kept thinking, you don't, you, you're not certain of what an Evil Dead film is. You don't know how much to lean into it is. And I, I came away thinking, I don't think, I think Evil Dead is like a light, lightning in a bottle. It only worked when it was made for like two p by Sam Raimi in the woods with his like mates. It's not the same thing. Putting just, putting a yeah. yeah a camera on the back of a plank of wood and running it through the, the that energy that kind of alchemy really shaped that film. Mm. And when it's studio sanctioned and given twenty times the budget, and you know put in a spreadsheet bells and whistles bells it doesn't doesn't have the same ring. So I think it's kind of uh, uh, limited. Not bad. Gruesome enough, decent enough, not scary, 
not really funny. I don't need it to be funny, but but not really that fun. Like I don't go into if I get on a roller coaster to go around a scary house, a haunted house at mm. the theme park, right? I don't expect to laugh, but I expect to have fun. Yeah, yeah. I expect to be thrilled. Nothing thrilled me in this, and it just also reminded me that how much that barbarian for us is like the high mm. watermark. Yeah, of what a horror film can do, Imagine and I know that horror. Yeah, because that I, I still think back to barbarian. I think it scared me. It was fun, and it was mm. funny and clever. And clever, yeah. you know, I, 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 it doesn't have to be, not I'm all horror films have to be a laugh out loud, but I had fun. I came out thinking that was enjoyable and I, I just didn't get that with this. So it's all right, but um, evil, meh, size. You know, it's interesting uh, hearing your thoughts about it because again, when I saw the trailer, I couldn't really place it as a modern horror. And I was wondering what pocket it would sit in. Mm. You touched on it, but it's like, we have had such a, from the late noughties and especially in the 2010s, the resurgence of safe horror that felt very mm. consolidated. You had the birth of the insidious conjuring Annabelle verses mm. with their number of sequels. In parallel, you had the explosion of paranormal activity, yeah. right? Yeah. And I think you could definitely, and even Sinister, right? You could definitely yeah. say that from the beginning, people were excited by that horror. Mm. And it was, it was quiet and bang. And I, I think in the beginning that was very exciting and it was high budget and mm. it felt modern, right? But I noticed, I mean, anyone who's watched this film, so A, they, I think they definitely got worse and yeah. their ideas became tired, but you started to predict when the scary bits yeah. would happen. And I knew a lot of people would watch sequels two or three to some of these films be like oh i just don't like scary movies and i go well yeah if i if i snuck up behind you with a balloon and popped it next yeah. to your ear you'd be scared but there's nothing yeah. clever about doing that just because i played the loudest yeah. sound i could so it's interesting to see that that i feel like i mean it's still going but you do have films like barbarian and as you said mm. scream six is very good and i'm wondering if you take the evil dead name yeah. from something that from what you've said sounds like it's completely different to what it once yeah. was but they thought well, let's just keep the ip and bring it yeah. forward in, in some way so it's interesting to hear that mm. it's look, not as much that i think it's about quite, quite i'm not saying that horror films can't have bits that jump out and scare you no if you jump said that's that's fine hey remember best jump scare of all time Mulholland drive Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I also think, just to clarify for, for listeners, the quite, quite bang thing, which Mark Kermo just and probably still does talk about on his show, it's something that he talked about with um, uh, Nigel Floyd, who's another British film critic. And when you say sneak up behind you with a uh, balloon mm. and pop it, uh, Nigel Floyd called that cattle prod cinema. Yeah. It's, a, it's a film tasing you, poking you to, to jump every time, yeah. but you're not actually getting scared. It's not the idea that's scary, Do you remember last it's just week, the sensation. Yeah. Do you remember last it? week when I told you about a ghost story? Yeah. A ghost story is an not- An idea that sticks is, with you. Is, is purely works on an idea level. It's yeah. not a horror film. Mm. It's, the, it's like, it's the other end of the, expect, of, of, of the spectrum, sorry. And um, in the same way that I also saw someone write once that like a comedy film isn't allowed to tickle you. Yeah. So you can't just yeah, do yeah. quite, quite bang. It's, it's cheap. Mm. It's a trick. It's, it's like someone walking slowly towards me from it fell up. It follows. It's an idea that's yes. forever scary that's, to me. Yes. It never, it never uh, um, screamed in my face. It's exactly. just slow walking. It's an idea. Right. Well, there you go, guys. I mean, I have noticed people having slightly uh, differing opinions on this film. So I would love to hear if you agree with George or if you don't, as always, send in your thoughts to hello at popkitchenpodcast.com. We'd read them out on the show. If you enjoyed it, I'm glad you got something out of it. Yeah. Maybe it's just me. Maybe I shouldn't have seen Evil Dead 2 so recently. That's my problem. Yeah, maybe it's like the attachment of what that was is t informing what yeah, you maybe. see. Maybe. For most I people, I kind of believe you. Yeah, thank you. Anyway, let us know. So I know we've just reviewed one of the big film releases this this week. Mm -hmm. But I also sometimes like to take the opportunity in that context to actually review a much smaller film that's getting yep. very limited viewing probably and might pass people by. And that is a, uh, a new British debut film called Kindling. Um, Kindling is a film set in um, the summer in England, about five friends, one last summer, four friends return home because one of them, Sid, the main character, is, uh, has cancer. And he's had cancer, he's been diagnosed for three years. And this is coming up on his, his his third year. The film begins with him realizing that it's been three years since the, the his, he received his diagnosis. And there's this, it's not stated, but there's this sort of element in the year in the air of, okay, well, a sense of purpose. This is there's a reason the friends have come back together. There's an awareness that this summer might be very meaningful, and that it might be the last one potentially of of, of Sid, depending on his. His illness. Um, he lives at home with his parents, played by Tara Fitzgerald and Jeff Bell. And 
he in this friendship dynamic he's uh supported by one of his close friends who kind of supervises him and, and looks after him and is kind of like a, a, sort of has come to an agreement with the parents as like a surrogate to be like well the, the parents will give him some space obviously mm-hmm. as a young man but one of his friends will kind of accompany him along, along the way and he's got these three other friends as well and uh you know without saying too much of the plot it's a short film it's only 90 minutes that um sid realizing this himself about his his own fate uh comes up with an idea about how to kind of make this summer count and make it last and it involves um collecting items that are meaningful uh to them and to him and to this group of friends and uh kind of developing a ritual that can kind of celebrate that and there's this idea of a fire and that's the kind of central theme in it um I always find it really interesting when I watch debut films and I, 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 there is this kind of energy that you get from them um, because despite their flaws, you, you, you do find something in there and, and it stays with you in a way that films that have been pressed through the system don't. And it's like when we talked about that film, The Strays, a few, a few months ago, yeah. that's the thing I had with that. Full of ideas, also very flawed, but I kind of something about that kind of... Uh, sparky freshness stays with you. Right? Um, the thing is with kindling is that on, on the surface of it, you'd be forgiven if you were slightly trepidatious with uh, the territory because going into this with the whole territory of one last summer, uh, you know, let's get the gang together. Let's go find some objects, bucolic, beautiful British summertime, mm. kids riding bicycles and running through fields of wheat there's a hint of cliche there. There's, there's, there's the element of cliche in its premise. And, you know, also when you watch a film like this, you think it is really hard to write uh, teenagers. Yeah. Uh, it is without, because obviously most films about teenage life and youth are made by people who are 10, 20 years older. And, yeah. and to get that right is, is so difficult. But what, what, what I was really touched by and what I liked about Kindling is that the film is made with such sensitivity and such emotional confidence in its story that it keeps it completely on an even keel and, and really sees you through. Of course, there are moments of dialogue that you might think, mm, and there's like, you know, there's like a meet cute between him and um, this, this girl in town that you're like, okay, that's very, that's very movie-like and, mm. and stuff, but that's fine. It, it doesn't matter because the, the, the heart of this film is so well-intentioned and, and, and accomplished that, um, like I said, it keeps it well-balanced. And crucially... The film knows when to be understated. The film knows when not to state too much. And I think that is its, 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 one of its key skills. Because with this kind of territory, you could either tip over into being sentimental, melodrama. Uh, it, 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 it's a difficult thing to balance when you're trying to deal with happy friendship and also this uh, sadness and tragedy. The bittersweet, it's hard to do. And I, I thought the film really did give it a even keel there are moments with uh the best parts of the film for me really worked with the parents that the particularly with the relationship with his dad just a really well observed dynamic of how parents are living with a, a child who they love love to death but love in a way that's complicated because they, they have that conflict with their care mm. and the mother feels this role of you know uh she doesn't want to have to keep telling people off for doing things with him, but she wants to make sure he looks after his health and the dad takes a slightly different opinion. Well, no, I want you know, he, needs, he needs to be relaxed. But there are moments of, of, the, of particularly with the father, that are, that are observed, that are so moving and, and, and really touching. Like, oh, I, I really believe that's not only a very male thing to happen, it's a very father thing to happen. I, I, I just knew it, that was really touching. Um, it's nice to see male friendship depicted in a warm supportive emotionally intelligent way mm. um that isn't destructive Very, quite rare it is quite yeah. rare and and sort of like the image of like a pack of five british blokes redeemed from being yobbish or something like that yeah, <laughs> yeah yeah um uh and so it's you know like i said it, it, it might pass people by but i know it's uh it's coming it's, a, it's in cinemas now but it's also getting uh released on digital platforms and i think it's nice. Might be making an appearance on the, in the BBC later this year. I think if you do get a ch- if you if you want to see what like uh, if you want to see a new debut British film and you want something that's interesting um, but uh, is 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 taking uh, 
story, a story that you might feel familiar with, but kind of deepening it emotionally. I think I think Kindling, Kindling is a one to, one to watch. It's 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 it's, it's a it's a really. I, I finished it by thinking, huh, that was. That, I, I stuck with that all the way. That was really emotionally confident, and I and I look forward to seeing where the directors take. Sorry, the director takes the you know emotional intelligence and passion from that onto their next work. It was based off a uh, short film from like ten years ago with George Mackay in from, you know from nineteen seventeen, mm -hmm. and uh, it's taken them years to put it together. And uh, yeah, solid stuff. You know, I like I like seeing these films come through. Anyway, it's out in cinemas and. Uh, it's available on digital platforms too. And I think if you are just interested in seeing uh, a debut British film from a new filmmaker that is uh, emotionally competent and looks beautiful as well. Mm. I, one thing I've, I really found interesting is that I, there are moments that, of, that because it, it's so British, you know, a churchyard in the background. And then um, a, there's a scene where they're, they're, they're walking through like the most generic cul-de-sac in British suburbia. It's where like most of the in-between, uh, the kind of place where the in-betweeners would be filmed. Yeah. And there's a couple of scenes like that, like, oh yeah, Christ, I've done that. I've lived yeah. that. Um, so I found that really good. So uh, if you're emotionally confident and competent and looks beautiful, a uh, good, good, solid, new 90 minute British movie called Kindling. Heading into emails, just like every single episode, we go through the emails that you guys sent to hello at popkitchenpodcast.com. Like I did. Heading into the emails now, we're going to get a strong reply from this person. I've noticed about this so film. much how everything that we say is just copying broadcasting that we've been exposed to in. Well, James radio. there with a familiar opinion. And as always, you can call us to 0794 yeah, 917 4964. Yeah, but there's, but there's a reason to, because obviously it's, it's clear. It's the equivalent of like copywriting. It's mm. just there's a reason words are arranged in a certain way. It's the it... rise as we present information and the falling as we yeah. draw it. You're doing it more close. than we actually do it. Yeah, yeah, of course. Doing, yeah. <laughs> but you, you always notice it there. But as always, if you wanted to send us an email, you can do. We're yeah, sending yeah. it. And I always do the email save. It's hello at popkitchenpodcast.com. <laughs> I'd like direct line. Direct line. Dion writes into the show and says, Hi both, exclamation mark. Hi. Dion here from Sunny Coventry. Happy to announce that I did not discover this podcast via TikTok, but from meeting George through work. Oh, right. Shortly after I met him, he posted the story of you both attending the premiere of The Crown Season 5. I thought I'd give the podcast a listen out of curiosity, but I've been hooked ever since. Really? It is now a staple of my work commute. So thanks for producing a great pod. Uh, we're addictive. Okay. We're a one in. Dion, great. So, no, th this is amazing. Love it. This is amazing because like, I- I saw that come in. I was like, ooh. I, like, you're just, like, I, you didn't, like, you didn't have to. That's the, there was no obligation. No, you could have, you could have just, you could have given a little, but you, you're, you're hooked. Yeah. We, Guys, follow us on Instagram. We're like hello, MSG. Podcast, we get, yeah. we, we, we yeah. get into people's bloodstream. Crack. What does Dion have to say? <laughs> Keep going. Dion says, I've really enjoyed how you both discuss and dissect all of the different aspects of what makes a good film. And I particularly enjoyed moments when you've discussed cinematography. Mm. I'd love to... <coughs> I'd love to hear what some of your favorite films are from that specific angle. Mm. Whether it is from the perspective of great visual storytelling, stunning visuals, use of color, interesting mm. compositions, camera movement, etc. The first film I watched where the cinematography really made me pay attention was The Grand Budapest Hotel, oh, yeah. which is going so viral on social yeah. media right now. Everyone is recreating um, Wes Anderson style. Every time style. I open my fucking TikTok. Yeah. <laughs> <It's just laughs> like, Especially because we're in like the filmy <laughs> sphere. Yeah. It's a little bit uh, back to the email. Uh, probably because it's so stylistic that it's hard to ignore. But I do now look forward to anything made by Wes Anderson. More recently, a film that stuck in my mind was The West Side Story. It was the first film I watched in a cinema. The after West Side the, Story. Now he puts The West Side Story, and I was waiting for you to come in, uh, in the cinema after the pandemic. But I'm glad I did, because it was a real treat for the eyes. The colors were spectacular, and in this instance, the success of the cinematography was much, very much linked to costume design. Mm. Special mention also has to go out to Better Call Saul, which I could genuinely watch and enjoy on mute. Although it's not a film, I certainly it certainly feels like a sh like it's, and it's shot like one. It's deliberate, playful, striking and motivated for me it's a visual masterpiece looking forward to some of your faves keep up the great work dion p.s i've also thought of a new game if you'd be interested i wonder if it would work instead of guessing the film from the cast you could guess the actor from the films they've been in yes, I yes. Think, did we do that once i think we did try that once but dion uh thank you for your email that's a really great email dion, that is mad that you listen i'm so i'm so pleased that you do dion is a very good very accomplished 
uh, filmmaker in his own right. Lovely. Um, and I've had the pleasure of working with him a couple of times. And it is an honor to have you listen to our show, Dion. So thank you. Love it. Um, uh, I did not force him to listen, just for the record. <laughs> um, yeah, it's always interesting when you say film. It sounds like an insult when you say, I, I could watch that on mute. Mm. But it, it, it does mean um, uh, nice things. Yeah. Um, just about. Um, so uh, about, onto, where, onto where's Anderson? Uh, oh, on West Side Story, absolutely. Cinematography is amazing. The um, I Want to Be in America sequence mm. in the new West Side Story in the center of it. Holy cow. And on the big screen, wow. Yeah. Like Qu- Quentin Tarantino said that and Top Gun Maverick were the two cinematic events of like the past 12 months. Yeah. He said that both of those films were pure cinematic spectacle. Mental. Now, I, I, I think I have some... Cinema, cinema, cinematography uh, answers, and these I just seem you know, like it's asking like, what are some of your favourite shots? We Basically. could do an entire separate podcast yes. where every week we talked about Our some of shots. the greatest shots of all time. So uh, stay tuned for the rest of of the podcast uh, every week well, we, to get okay. them. But while so, we're here, we've we, we talked first of all recent examples. We've talked like last year about loads of great films yeah. uh, that that are shot really well. Living was one of the best yeah. shot films of Beautiful. last year. Absolutely exquisite to look at. It was like Visually art. distinct, and you'd, you'd know that it's just, living by just looking at a single frame. Oh, just fantastic. Uh, also, I mean, Empire of Light, not a great movie, but uh, that I, I would happily yeah. watch on mute yeah, because the story yeah. is irrelevant, yeah. but absolutely something to watch. Um, Blonde, Films of course. are better to watch on mute. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Blonde, Blonde, of course, is great. Yeah. Um, I do love the use of colour in films, and I, I, I do do get like such a like, a buzz off of it. I almost like I want to lick the screen. You know, like in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Oh, yeah. You haven't seen it, have you, the original? Not the original. The no. bit where they, lick, they lick the wallpaper because they want to get the fruit out mm. of it, right? And like, um, I, I watched a film the recently called Betty Blue. It's like a cult film from the 80s, which is a load of nonsense really, but it's mm. so beautiful and colorful. Like, you know, it's f- colorful French style from the 80s. It, beautiful, do the right thing is shot one feel like that that, the bit with the it's just colorful all the way through but the three old guys sat up against the bright bright um, red brick wall and they're just a little white dot in the corner with their string vests and stuff Mm. love that um i do think uh oh oh, 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 sorry uh one of the best films most stylishly shot films that you wouldn't think of being a stylishly shot films Mm. uh, film is actually rain man Okay. So, you, so Rain Man, people obviously think about the performances and and you know Tom Cruise and Dustin Hoffman, great. If you watch that film, that film is shot so stylishly. Not not just because obviously you got Tom Cruise and the, the you know the Ray Bans and stuff, but like it's about driving cross country because um, you know Dustin Hoffman's character refuses to fly, and like it's um, in this in this convertible and it's shooting the passing pylons uh, in at, at golden hour in the open desert, in the re- reflection of the rear view mirror. It's just, I remember watching and thinking, this film does not need to be this stylish mm. for the for the story it's trying to tell, but it just, I just, just loved it. Um, the Graduate, sorry, I've really thought about no, it. No, please. The Graduate is a great, a really stylishly shot one. If you, I, you can take individual frames from The Graduate and just think, it's beautiful. And like, there, there's a bit, when they shoot, the way that they shoot the swimming pools, you know, the LA, swimming pools in people's backyard it's like david hockney's paintings right it's just the oh, beautiful in the play of light but i think the ultimate if i just think of my favorite cinematography in a film probably the tree of life oh manuel lebetsky oh, fish eye yeah huge um the uh, racing across the salt flats behind jessica chastain we the sunset covered totally uh, the the prolific presence of the tree of life in many top uh, internet uh, top 10 lists it's a yeah. beautifully short film whether or not i think it works for you uh i think it's very much dependent on what mood you're in but i've done as a sort of you know videographer as by profession i've been sent many uh, briefs with decks that have sh- the, sh- the cinematography <laughs> of Emmanuel Lebetsky and I've been asked to capture that same spirit. Do this but not <laughs> my this. work with me and like uh, uh, less help. Let's just say, no, Emmanuel Lebetsky, like any, yeah. anyone, anyone who's, who basically wants something shot wide without necessarily symmetry will reference Emmanuel Lebetsky. It's, uh, it's yeah. always beautiful. To and I, sorry, can I just say like, I, I ha- I've, I've been building a list of cinematographer films I find cinematographically interesting yeah. on my phone for a while. So this, this, this is 
is why this yeah, is so yeah, timely. Yeah. I was like, oh yeah, I'm actually going to use this. Yeah, I mean, like, you'll, you'll know that like uh, when I'm talking about a film, I'll often talk. I try to do my best now. There's a great website called Shot on What, and it tells you uh, if you do know what it is. It's the camera they shoot it on, all the lenses they used, the cinematographer, and you can Google most, not all films, but a lot of films, and it will tell you how it was shot. And I'm doing my best wow. to look into now whether or not the film was shot on uh, spherical lenses, anamorphic lenses, whether it was shot on Kodak film or if it was shot digitally, digitally, if it's using like the Arri Super 35 or if it's shot on full frame and large format. Whoa. I'm really trying to learn more about what having, you know, uh, if you shoot something on seven, 15 by 70 mil film does to the effect of your shot and why that changes if you shoot, you know, 35 mil. And um, I, uh, I'm always trying to sort of infer it into why a cinematographer chose to shoot with certain frame size. And I, I, I've gone on so many, but and I, I won't go on a big list, but I will talk about one clip that I saw, I want to say within two weeks. And it was a scene from Jurassic Park where uh, Samuel L. Jackson is looking at the computer after Newman's just cocked up the whole system. <laughs> Laura Dern is le leaning over and the sort of ranger guy's there. And the camera, this is all one, so I've watched Jurassic Park 20 times in my life probably. And I've never noticed the genius of the scene until someone did a TikTok breaking down why it's so perfect and the genius of Spielberg. Is this camera starts shooting between these two computers with all of your characters perfectly blocked. It, comes in, it slowly trucks in, like the audience is leaning into the frame. Samuel L. Jackson realized something. Laura Dern makes a decision and she moves. The camera then comes up to reveal Hammond's reaction, turns back and back and forth and then closes in wow. on Hammond for a line that leaves you tense. And I'm like, all of that scene, was perfectly focus pulled, trucked, yeah. jibbed, moved, turned, swiveled, and yeah. it's like the most engaging choreography. Uh, choreography. And I, it completely passed me by. I now I'm like now I need to rewatch Jurassic Park <laughs> for like the twenty something time, um, which we did last year. We did yeah, we passed you by that moment. Uh, there are there are so many shots that I adore. I think uh, if I'm going to be lazy and just think of one that really grabbed my attention, um, the halfway point in Blade Runner 2049 when uh, oh, God, yeah. the uh, the orange washout and uh, is it Kane in the center of the Kay. frame. Okay, and you're just, uh, it's just a shot that you never forget. It immediately grabs your attention without yeah. making any noise and without the camera really moving. Yeah. That's a beautiful shot that I think of a lot as a modern example. Yeah, yeah. Wow, I, I don't have one to go I, on. I, I, will, I will talk about these we could every do single week. But like it's we like, it, there's something very like flavor about it. I, I, I always yeah. feel like my mouth watering yes. with such good cinematography. Mm. Oh, call me by your name, gorgeous to yeah. look at. I mean, just oh, like, God, I start oh. moonlight. Yeah, yeah, slick. The the scene when um, they're bathing under the blue moonlight in the mm. ocean, and then yeah, all of it, <laughs> all of it's amazing. I think I think you've conflated two scenes there. They don't, he bathes in the water during the day, but yes. then he has the happy ending on the beach during You're the right. nighttime. To put it crudely, yeah. <laughs> Dion, uh, thank you so much for your email. It's great to hear from you. I hope you're well, and uh, yeah, thanks thanks for your support. Thank you, Dion. This next email is from Seb, who says hello. To start off. Hope you both well. James, you well? Yeah, very well. And thank you for this gem of a podcast. Oh, mate, thank you. What a joy it is to listen in every week to your thoughts over cinema and your travel exploits. James's travel exploits, we should say. I've been referring to you, I've been referring your podcast to everyone, everyone I know who enjoys TV and film. Thank you. Your insight into movies, new and old, is lovely and refreshing. Oh, thank you. It's oh, there, There's more praise here. I mean, I guess I read it. Do we read it? Do, do, I guess very we read kind. it. It's a testament to your dedication to the product. It's a dedication... <clears throat> It's a testament it to your dedication <laughs> to the production, editing, and topic selection to the podcast. You're very kind. Even on the movies or shows I'm not interested in, you have me gripped. Oh, thank God. That's like a, <laughs> once again, showing the beauty of conversation over movies, which you both exude. This is, I mean- Very sweet. I'm blushing. This is, this is a lot. Once again, showing a, a blah, blah, blah. This was so apparent when you were discussing There Will Be Blood, one of my favorites. We've always said that- if we cannot be professional or, exp or expertise, we must be engaging. Yes, we try. Because <laughs> otherwise there's nothing left. That's why I wear a stripy shirt <laughs> yeah. to keep you looking. Yeah. A few discussion points for you both. There's, there's a few questions yeah, you put yeah. here. It's a densely packed email. Mm -hmm. Number one, has there ever been a film which you hadn't seen in the cinema that you wish you could have? I do believe we've had that question before. Yeah. I believe my answer was probably maybe like the original Avatar, but then I didn't go see the new one at the cinema. So what am I saying? Mine's uh, 2001, A Space Odyssey. I'd love yeah, to see You can, that. you know, they, they, I know, they I, run I, it. It's very it's, possible. Yeah, <laughs> it's one of the great films. I um, think, uh, and I think I would like to see, uh, oh, sorry, uh, no, I think I would, I would love to have seen There Will Be Blood mm. at the cinema, but I would love to have seen and will look out for, which they haven't done in a long time, Blade Runner 2049 yeah. at the IMAX. Yeah, I, I, they should do that. 
Um, that and uh, Apocalypse Now. Um, I've really just only kind of realized this is the thing, well, I'd say like within the last like four years, that uh, projected film screenings are like next level good. Yes. <laughs> right? Yeah. If you can find, I mean, we're very lucky we live in London where there's like great, we've got BFI and there's just like great access yeah. to these kind of things. But if you ever have access to a screening that is able to project and screen celluloid yeah. over a digital projection, it oh, sounds yeah. like the most wanky thing to say, but like it was, it was watching Christopher Nolan's projected IMAX that made me realize. Yeah. Uh, seeing film projected in colour is like it's an, the fidelity um, and then it? Hateful Eight I saw projected oh, in film wow, because Tarantino yeah. always pushes to have his film yes. projected it is uh, and they literally remember they will get the film brought in vans and they have to literally stitch it together yeah, like they used to the, like they used to and it, it's it, I can't describe it you hear the film go and it is like the magic of cinema yeah. and the the, 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 the tactile nature of the film is yeah. there and it's it's really wanky if you haven't uh, no, no. done it yourself but I'm now like looking out for those special types of screenings because they create a very good experience um, Mulholland Drive I said the other day yes. would have loved to have been enclosed and locked away yes. and just I, to have washed that, well, let uh, that wash over uh, me someone has told me this this might be an anecdote that is completely apocryphal but I will just say it anyway uh, a guy at work I know who uh, and I'm sorry if I've already said this on the podcast mm. who loves Mulholland Drive said that uh David Lynch has a, like a clause that if you sh- if you show Mulholland Drive in cinemas, you're not allowed to like balance that, or you're not allowed to affect the audio levels, right? Because there's a the bit towards the end of Mulholland Drive where it goes really crazy and the volume goes really loud. Yeah. He's like, it's meant to be unbearably loud. Yeah. It's meant to be ridiculously <laughs> loud, and you're not meant to turn it down. You're not meant to even it out. It's mm. meant to be so uncomfortable. And he's like, I don't want anyone touching that. Okay, yeah. <laughs> that's my David Lynch number two. I feel that the correct selection of mu- music and sounds really makes a film. Mm. Another all-time favorite of me that shows this is be- shows this beautifully is Wally. Yes, its choice of music is perfect for each sequence, light and playful or frantic. Music for me draws you into the world of the film and into the heart of characters, and has the artistic choice to direct the audience's thoughts. So, having said it, this, it also doesn't have as much dialogue to lead you through. So, yes, music yeah. becomes just as more important. Hey, they've been saying it for years, but Pixar films, silent cinema, it mm. all comes from there. Uh, Although I have a bone to pick with Pixar, but anyway, later. Later. What films do you think have mastered their sound design and music stores? Oh, I mean, huge question. I mean, where do you... Where, uh, I mean, sound, I on... sound design, I mean, I, I love sound design when, yeah. it, when you listen and, and pay attention to it, but I, I really couldn't... I mean, There Will Be Blood has yeah. good sound design. I feel like Alien has good sound design. I will mention this one because I watched a whole featurette on it, but the Denis Villeneuve's Dune invented so many sounds and they had this amazing featurette with the guy who did all the sound and how they captured sand how they captured things moving through sand the onithopter dragonfly things i think it's called like an an onithopter and just like the that they talked about the harkonnens having a their costume design was um bug like and crustacean and scale like and 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 sort of gross and and uh sort of hivish yeah. and they sort of put all these layering sounds of bugs moving oh, at, when wow. their armor moved versus different things yeah. and i'd want to i'd love to sort of rewatch it before i go and see dune part deux. um <laughs> but uh yeah well, i think like, that's a modern one but like again i could do you remember go when we talked about the exorcist about when we said that when uh father Karras goes approaches the the door I and mean, anytime any character approaches the door of yeah. uh, reagan's bedroom they they play up these primal triggers, which is the sounds of like bees swarming and like yes like, yes I remember, predators yeah. and like, that was Lines brilliant roaring and all that. Uh, last question: One of my favorite acting moments is the last scene in Captain Phillips. Great oh, ending, great movie so ending. Good. Tom Hanks' acting performance alone. I'm sorry, alongside the military medics uh, yeah. that I believe were real U.S. serving medics was just so believable for its show, show of relief. Freedom, safety, and pure exhaustion. I think that's one it's, of Tom Hanks's best ever scenes. Yes, I. Uh, ter- so I oh, you haven't ending. seen it, and hopefully you've seen the it's film. It's not my blood. It's not, not my, my blood. blood. Yeah. Oh, oh, God. oh okay. Pain here. What moments like this stand out? What moments we like did this? Not do that I know. <laughs> Sorry, we did not do that justice <laughs> I know, at all. Not my blow. I, I have pain here. Maybe cut it. Um, <laughs> no, what moments it. like this stand out for you, either in a scene or an entire performance? What? Mm. Uh, okay, James. I'm going to try and read through the lines there. Very stacked performances. No, 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 no. A single acting moment in a in a film, mm. like a scene, like a like a moment you go. That's. Great for me. We I talked did, about there will be blood. We talk, I can't. I, I, I <laughs> got to put. I got to put that aside. But not far off. <laughs> yeah. Phantom Thread. Oh, I, right. I do remember <laughs> the scene where he orders breakfast at the cafe. I he just does something when he realizes that he finds Alma interesting, mm. and he sort of does this sort of like cute like 
mm, look in his eyes. And I just found it so effortless and so mm. brilliant. And that was the moment in the film I just thought, oh, I'm going to just sink into this and let this mm. magic work. He is on another level. I love that performance in that. Um, James, any others? Nothing's coming to mind because I have so many. But, really but it, 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 I do like the idea of looking for the small moments, yes. the small things Little that bits. acting that happen in performances. Give me a second. Uh, like, it'll probably come back to us in a week or two. So <laughs> you haven't heard the end of this. Um, now, uh, Seb, oh, sorry. No, I will give one. In the original Matrix, when Mr. Smith, Agent Mr. Smith, Smith, is interrogating Morpheus, he's got the little bits in his brain yeah. and they're trying to hack into his brain to get the codes. And uh, Hugo Weaving does this amazing monologue where he talks, about, obviously he's like a sentient AI oh, yeah. in a human body. And he, di he delivers this softly spoken, quiet, but incredibly captivating reason as to why he does what he does. And he, he looks and he's like, this place, mm. this zoo, this reality, whatever you want to call it, I can't stand it. Mm. It's the smell. Yeah. And he has this like disdain for organic being, for yeah. human, for, for mistake, for, for organic. And it just, it yeah. just, there's a wonderful rapturing scene and then he gets it. No, I agree. Also the one that I just came out to be, which I did deliver astoundingly last year is Gary Oldman's performance in Leon. Do you yes, remember, I remember did saying, whole yes. scene. You did the whole scene. It was um, fantastic. That, I, was, I was there watching the, it like this. Every <laughs> single part of that scene when he does the raid in Leon, he talks about classical music. I adore. It's like, pretty over the Captain top. Phillips, but, fantastic. Um, Seb, then you, then you give us a uh, suggestion for a film quiz, but in the interest of time, because we have answered three questions there. I like uh, that. We will get back to that. We will that. get back to and that. And thank you everyone who's sending game recommendations. We did do a call out and people are sending them, which is really cool. Next up is from Ant, who writes in and says, hi both. First of all, I just want to say I love the podcast. It's now become a favorite of mine and has helped me through some tough times. So thank you. Oh. Podcasts can really do that. Yes. When you just, your mind is occupied, you just go into it and it's like listening to some friends having a conversation. So and that's really you're, kind. You're more thank than you. welcome. I've never written into a podcast before or any show for that matter. But we when are, I we are, this is pride of place. Yeah, I'm, I'm impressed. Welcome in with a big hug. Uh, when I heard James's review of Mulholland Drive, I felt I had to, as in my opinion, it is one of, if not the greatest film ever made. Well, there you go. Like people, didn't I say, people will, uh, if you can listen on the yeah. audio feeds to uh, my, my watching the first time of Mulholland Drive. But yeah, I said this film has a stickiness. People have regarded it as some of the highest film of all time. People have also not got it. Yeah. It's not worked for some people. Uh, and goes on to say, the thing that left the deepest impression on me is that the film is unnerving throughout, as James mentioned, but you can never quite put your finger on why. This is very true. Uh, the first half an hour looks like it's just a regular story playing out, but everything just seems slightly off. Mm. You're aware of something not being quite right, but you can't quite work out what it is. For me, films reach another level when your experience of watching the film mirrors the experience of the characters within it. I like that. Mm, that's very true. That's very good. The disorientation, fear, and confusion felt by the viewer is the same as that of the main character. Betty, as reality slowly creeps in as her dream unravels throughout the movie. This creates another dimension to the viewing experience that makes it so special. Roger Ebert wrote a review of this film, and I thought that his ending paragraph, su paragraph summed it up perfectly. Quote, this is a movie to surrender yourself to. If you require logic, see something else. Mulholland Drive works directly on the emotions, like music. Individual scenes play well by themselves, as they do in dreams, but they don't connect in a way that makes sense. Again, like dreams. Mm. The way you know the movie is over is that it ends, and then you tell a friend, I saw the weirdest movie last night, just like you tell them you had the weirdest dream. Thank you again for making the podcast, and I hope you both continue for many years to come. And thank, thank you so much. Thank you Beautiful so much. Email. Beautiful email. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's not a, it is about, it's all about subconscious. You look at that and you go, that's a subconscious trail of thought. I will go watch it and I'll try and watch it in the cinema because then you then you feel more bound to, to, to get through Let it. Let me know, I'll also, come with. I have a theory, by the way, just yeah. to massively interject here. Um, I realize that if you, if you have a film on your watch list that you're struggling to get to, you, the film that kind of sits there, you think, I want to watch it, but mm. I don't know when's a good time. I'm talking for me, it's a lot of my criterion. Yeah. It's Stalker. It's yeah. Yee Yee. I don't know when to sit down and watch these three hour, mm. uh, oblique, 40 year old I'll foreign films. I'll do with you when right. you do it, yeah. I realized the best thing to do, watch it in the morning. Yes. If you sharp watch brain. it in the morning, you've got a sharp brain, you've got much more patience and Mm. When you finish it, which you ultimately will, it'll sit with you the rest of the day. You you have the rest of your day, and you feel like you've completed something. Mm -hmm. Don't put it off for the evening when you're tired and other stuff gets in the way. Mm. If you watch it in the morning, oh my god! And I realized that the other day when I watched something, and now I'm I'm I, I, it's op opened. It's like I've discovered a whole period of time yeah. that I can use to break through these really big films. You'll just be you'll just 
more ready for it. Guys, if you didn't know, we did talk about There Will Be Blood. We looked back and we did Mulholland Drive. We like doing little uh, jumps back if you guys enjoy them too. So do check them out if you want to hear our thoughts on those. This next email is from Tahar, who says, Hello, James and George. It's your favourite Pakistani student studying in London back yes, again. Yes, Pakistani correspondent. Wrote in about Joyland. Yes. This time I had a question about cinema snacks. Interesting. Mm. I haven't been able to catch up on your entire back catalogue yet. So sorry um, if you've already answered this, but before this before but with you guys talking about how quentin tarantino would feel about food in cinema and watching films uh sorry you guys were talking about how quentin tarantino would feel about food in the cinema and and watching films while i to her was fasting during ramadan i've been thinking about how much having something to snack on mm. during a film impacts my experience to it having to watch a couple of films now without anything to snack on because of ramadan I do feel myself noticing the time of the film much more. With snacks, I feel like I'm easing to a film, and so the first 30 minutes doesn't really feel that long, but without them, I'm more aware that a film has already passed uh, the, the 30 minutes, which is usually the point at which I start developing my initial thoughts on the film. I wanted to know your guys' opinions on how snacks in a cinema impact your viewing experience. Additionally, being a broke student, I always bring in my own snacks, yeah. which have ranged from burgers, peat burgers. Sorry, no, we're gonna okay. get, I'm gonna cut yeah. all snacks. Uh, burgers, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> burgers, pizza, popcorn, nachos, M and M's, and even an apple and orange. Oh, even an apple and orange. I wanted to know what are your favorite cinema snacks. I'd have to say Odin's nachos are a favorite, current favorite of mine. When I do splash out a bit more, keep up the great work. I love your guys' more laid back approach to talking about films and a sense of community you foster. It feels like hearing your mates who enjoy films as much as you do instead of a, a critic detached from most people keep slaying to her so thank you for your email hold on funny. on snacks max writes into the show and says hi pop kitchen huge fan of the show and you guys i wanted to know what do you guys eat when you're in the cinema i'm not overly health conscious but i find the idea of eating a bucket of sugary popcorn a bit overindulgent sometimes interested to hear both of your outtakes okay. all the best max look max, we've not covered okay, cinema we have snacks it, and but it, it's a big part of the experience to, to heart I have to say, and I'm really sorry. I, I, I respect your opinion, and I, and I, and I, and I, I love your, your emails. But I not only do not eat snacks in the cinema, okay. I am actually quite anti snacks in the cinema. Mm -hmm. um, I remember I'm being not at anti, the Prince. I'm going to hear you uh, out. Well, well, I've heard this, but yeah, go on. Well, no, okay, first of all, like it, it's very distracting. Having I, I will tolerate popcorn. Yeah, I have well, a friend. Popcorn's the loudest, most cumbersome. No, nachos are loud. Nachos are loud. And rustling in a bag of you know sweets, it, no, sweets, yeah, that's uh, revels, whatever. Yeah, I have a friend who orders who has popcorn when we go. Mm. He eats it mostly during the trainers and he eats it when it's during the film, very quietly, very politely, and I barely notice it. And I always, yeah. I say to him, I'm like, I really respect how you ate your popcorn during that. <laughs> um, but I, I've been. I mean, I was at the Prince Charles Cinema once, and a guy came in with a full takeaway. No, okay? I've seen and curry. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. It was curry. Mm -hmm. And to heart, a burger, a pizza. I, I'm sorry, that really actually also, gets my go. On burger and pizza, the Curzons and Everyman's, the upmarket boutique <laughs> sofas, I, I that do they do pizza and burger? So like, you go, yeah. you buy a ticket, and while the trailers are coming out, but sometimes within the first five to ten minutes of the film. The yes. server brings out yes. a full burger pizza. I think a burger is too much. You need to look too much at what you're doing yeah. that it takes away from the film. Look, I always think the same of a curry, but the curry is a problem be, because of the smell. To, to be clear, I'm not saying that the pleasure of food and the pleasure of film are devoid from each other. Yeah, God yeah. knows we used to do it, okay? <laughs> but but in the, in the cinema space, I, I, I think a snack like... A burger is not a snack. It's, it's a, a meal. meal it's a okay, meal you need to look at, and there's sauce and chips. And I, 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 I draw the line strongly at burgers and pizza. pizza I can understand. You know, what? No, pizza. I can almost no, understand. I'm no, not saying it's acceptable because no. you can't just open a box of pizza and start no. like it, anything that needs to move too much. Okay, so uh, the hot, wait. The hotter and the smellier it is, it is bad. It's 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 bad. It's not. Allowed. That's why I really don't like when people bring nacho. If if a guy sits next to me at a cinema yeah. and he's got a hot, stinky plate, a plate of nachos with the sour cream and the jalapenos yeah. and the cheese and it just stinks so much yeah. and their breath starts much. I, I do not think nacho is an appropriate cinema no. snack. No. They're just, they're, they're, and it's wet. It's moist. Yeah. No. I, I, I just, I'm sorry, like also, I, yeah, when you're at home. I'm, I, I will sometimes indulge in a bag of Maltesers. At the cinema? Yeah. Okay. So, so for me, has to be a big uh, event film I'm looking forward to. Yes, oh, big film where there's lots of loud noises to oh, also yeah. cover your eating. Six pound fifty. Yeah, what's money? I'm in a big film. Let's go. It's hype. Yes. Let's go. Big I know. film. Star Wars. But but also, I think there's something interesting to harm what you say when you say. Um, I noticed that when I eat a snack, I I don't really notice the first half an hour go go by. Yeah. 
And but when I don't have snacks, I really feel the passage of time. That is actually part of the, that's that's kind of my my point because mm. and a lot of filmmakers are saying, I find it. I've noticed that even when I eat food at home when I'm watching something. I'm not concentrating mm. at 100. percent Blood's going to the stomach, not the brain. And, all, and you're just you're just not taking stuff in. And I've seen it with people who I've watched films with when they they're not engaging it the same way. And the fact is, someone's made a film, good or bad. That someone's like put together this film for you to watch, mm. and all they're asking for is at, you know, usually 90 minutes of your time, maybe two hours. Okay, recently some films have been stretched into like three mm. hours, but you just have to sit there. You cannot eat for two hours. You cannot do it. And like. The odd like nibble at a snack or a bag of Maltesers is one mm-hmm. thing, but like really, isn't food more enjoyable when you give it mm. your full attention? And yeah. isn't film more enjoyable when you give it your full attention? Mm. So I, I'm sorry to her. I, I, I respect your, uh, your email and, and, and I, snacking is one thing, but like the bigger the meal, and I actually don't like the whole every man uh, bringing mm, in food yeah. and stuff as bougie and as, as, as posh as it sounds, mm. but like. That's also, I've, I've heard people have been in those cinemas and then people just going, oh, excuse me, I yeah, actually yeah. ordered the thing. Yeah. How disruptive. How hard is it, people, mm. just to sit in a room and watch something? I, 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 when I'm at those posh ones, I get a large glass of Malbec and it's yeah. divine. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, because it's quiet. Um, uh, sometimes I look Am at Am I people, being unfair? No, no, I think it's totally fair. I think, I think food is, is gone completely out of control. And I've seen couples, people, families who, uh, money aside, because it must cost them 300 pounds, yeah. They go all out. They get large popcorn. They get yeah. like uh, a big bag of sweets yeah. and, a, and a large slushy. Yeah. And I just look at them and I'm like, what are you doing? Yeah. This, is, this is like enough food as a meal, but yeah. you're just having crap. Yeah. And I'm like, uh, and, and, and they're so over encumbered heading to their seat. And I'm like, what are you, what? So loud. Who marketed so this to you? They're not here for the film. They're just there to sit and, and think. I, 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 mean, I always chew gum. That's what I always have. You are a chew gum chewer. That's fine. That's I'm a gum chewer. If anyone follows, you know, Mark Kermode and Simon Mayo, mm. they had the whole code of conduct and they used to say that you can't eat anything that is louder than a, a was it a bread roll with like uh, a ham filling or something like that. Yeah, that's fair. And and, and do, do everyone a favor, please. If you have brought food and it is like a packet of minstrels or, you know, like a, a, a tank fastics during the ads, open them when no one cares. Yeah. And then have them open on your lap ready so that your hand can go in without rustling yeah. the pack. Do not rustle. Don't, I, when also, the film starts, go. I've do, also. Do, have you got that? Have you got the thing? Oh, I've, I've also, I've worked at a cinema. Mm. I've seen the stuff that goes into the nacho sauce and the nachos it, and the popcorns that, and stuff. Oh yeah, I can only imagine. And, and the drinks machine. Oh. You, it, it, I, that's why I go to, the, go to the cinema with a glass of water. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And don't drink too much because then you have to pee. Well, exactly. Guys. Getting back to a more positive point, but like, I'm so glad we covered this. We've not done it. Film is 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 it, it, it film film. Is. film I, 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 mm. There are films. That, this is going to be stretching the metaphor a bit, but there are films that I've seen that have felt so good afterwards that you've enjoyed so much. It feels as nourishing as a good meal. Yeah. Why disrupt that with this other thing on the side? Give a film your full attention. Go for dinner Things afterwards. Things like a, a bit of gum. Yeah. A little bit of popcorn. A fairly unintrusive so not blowing bubbles <laughs> yeah exactly just then you know what do, have that watch your film and then afterwards go and get a nice burger mm, some pizza with sip, the person you saw with with. Pizza, or even on your own and yeah. give that food your full amount of time as you're thinking about the film mm. but thank you to her we're always up for a debate well there you go guys that was uh, a little bit of food etiquette we got <laughs> i don't think we got the most animated about that that we have yes. in a while i think you're a bit more anti-food than me Sorry, but no, it's I, per- I, it's I think no pun intended. Fair. It's personal taste. There you go. This next one is from Saf and Harrison, who writes a double, says, a double, a, a co authored email. One hand on one half of the keyboard <laughs> and one hand on the other. Uh, hi, guys, Saf here. Can I start by saying, and I hope this doesn't come across as creepy, I'm pretty sure I am your number one fan. Oh, really? I read that creepy. That's good. That, well, we love that claim. Pretty sure. After seeing you guys on TikTok a couple of months ago and heading over to YouTube and Spotify, I have now watched every single episode more than twice. Another more than twice. Get in. This is like a three times over. We're in your blood. I love that. and Harrison, if this is the third time you're listening to this. Thank you. Points. I salute you. And if this is like the second, you're like, God, I've got to go all the way back. (laughs) Yeah. Wow. Thank you. Even the early stuff. Even the God early shit, The bootlegs. <laughs> but yeah, the rough, the rough ones. We, you know what's really sad? If you look at the thumbnails, we we have aged. It's like, I notice I'm like, yeah. 
<laughs> it's gonna be a horrible time lapse of our of our decaying faces. That's what doing a podcast does to someone's yeah. face. You never like taking a picture of yourself every week in the same like setup, really. Anyway, although I've always had a love. Oh, sorry. Um, more than twice. Me and my fiance make an evening out of every new episode and watch together. That is, I love it. In the era when there is so much so stuff much to, watch, to watch, we are the prime content choice for Let's you, look staff. at them and freak them out. Here you are, you're watching us. This is your evening. <laughs> Do you like make your food and sit down with oh, it? Oh yeah, I, I love hope you're it. sitting comfortably. We're in your living room. Oh, is it? Li- I'm picturing living room. They put us on laptop the big TV. in bed. Could be laptop in bed or bed in front of a TV with the laptop linked to it. <laughs> Maybe whichever way you're watching it this. Might be, they might be like hugging with the phone. It's a bit too close. <laughs> a bit too. <laughs> Either way, hey, what are you doing? George and I are with you. <laughs> um, Although I've always had a love for film and TV, you guys have really sparked a deeper interest and made me fall back in love with cinema. Oh, great. I watched a lot of films as a teenager, but as I've gotten older, my anxiety can have a strange effect on my movie choices, often causing me to turn to comfort films and safe films or re-watching sitcoms. Oh, that's very oh, typical, right? Yeah. Everyone, just the Straight comfort of a sitcom. Uh, and rarely trying anything new. But listening to your podcast has got me excited about new films, films I hadn't oh, seen and films that are out of my comfort zone. I recently watched The Northman, which is a perfect example of the kind of film I would never have given the chance to before. But listening to you guys talk about it made me interested and intrigued, made me feel like I could. I mean, can I just say that is a film to burst your comfort zone. Yeah, yeah. That doesn't hold back. It's it's out there. Um, It's safe to say my partner is very happy as I'm watching more things he wants to see as well, instead of just reruns of Paddington 2 and New Girl. Hey, hey. Not bad. Not bad. (laughs) Not bad choices. Yeah. Nothing wrong. New Girl. Anyway, no, the, oh, sorry, just I better just clarify. New girl, fine. Yeah, goes downhill, but yeah, a bit comfortable, cozy, oh, totally. brightly lit. Yeah, has its moments. Great you're cast, in and you're sort of. left. Anyway, the reason it took me so long to email us because I wanted to think of a good question. Me and I, me and my fiance were watching you guys the other day, hey, and talking about Titanic, and he said he would love to see a remake of Titanic, but as a horror. Later, we Googled this to find it has actually been done, but looks terrible. It got us thinking, and we wondered, what are some films you guys think would make an interesting remake in another genre? Ooh. One more thing. I recently, re- I recently re-listened to the episode where you guys spoke about There Will Be Blood. I've only seen it once and found it long and boring, and like I didn't see what everyone else was on about. But after hearing George say that it got better and better the more times he watched it, I'm going to give it another go yeah. with fresh eyes and my newfound love for film. Thanks again for all the amazing content you put out there. We are loving every single episode, you guys. And now my comfort show, we've replaced New Girl. Fuck you, Dewey. Sorry, Deschanel. Do- Dewey Deschanel. <laughs> Dewey, Dewey Deschanel. <laughs> Shit. Hey I just did the glass thing. Am I tough enough? <laughs> Hell yeah, I'm tough enough. <laughs> what you doing? Um, um, now my comfort show, we are recommending you to everyone we know. Thanks. Saf and Harrison. Would love to hear the email on the show. Brax, sorry, it's a long one sent from my iPhone. God damn it. Um, just an applause on that one. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Great email. Kind. And as always, so sweet to hear people talking about uh, re- fall, uh, falling in love with film again. But George, are there any films that you would like to see remade in a different genre? So we're talking like when they meet well, this is TV, but when they yeah. remade Fresh Prince of Bel Air as, as Fresh Prince, no, it was just called Bel Air, wasn't it? They did a oh, serious. I completely version. missed that. No, no, they they, they did that. I mean, yeah. I think it's my maybe maybe has a season two, just a oh, okay. serious version of it. I mentioned the other day the uh, the Nolan reboot of Bond in the fifties, uh, taking it back to like the Soviet spy thing. Did you said the other day. I'm that. pretty sure that was like a year, year ago. Yeah. No, it was a couple of months ago. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. With um, weeks. What are we thinking of then? A film. That was remade in a different genre. Yeah, it's like different genres quite hard to unpack. So it's easy to make everything funny. It's easy to paradise everything. So we shouldn't say things as comedies, really, because I'd like Avatar to be remade into something that has teeth. Mm, controversial. <laughs> um, I think it'd be funny to see uh, a Marvel Hulk movie that's like a Safety Brothers film. <laughs> like you, take, you, take, oh, yes. you take the, the try not to lose the, the idea of like he needs to remain cut or like crank yeah yeah you yeah know? like crank or safety brothers safety brothers do hulk as crank yeah you, yes. you completely bring back the hulk down to this idea that he cannot lose his temper in a world that is frantic and hectic and yeah. like just everything is out to just poke you with a prod and, you, and like you have that and he's trying to remain calm and the, the idea of crank with Jason Statham where like for some reason he has to keep moving yeah, yeah, yeah. but can't lose his temper and it's this fine balance and you could have like just completely off the wall you take that IP and mm. you do it do that that's one that just came to mind I don't think I can top that that's good I've really tried to think about it that's it Saf and Harrison that thank you that's a really good question it'll it's probably a really come back good to me it's hard week, but good question thank you I'll stick with yours I'd see that and then t- what would you call it 
what the Hulk Safdie yeah. brothers. Ooh, yeah. Uh, uh, calm gamma, something about gamma. gamma like, yeah, gamma, gamma, gamma ray, gamma guy, gamma guy, gamma guy. Hey, you gamma guy. Hey, I don't talk to yeah. you like that. I can't lose my. And everyone's like shouting at you. You got the little thing. All right, yeah, on Tuesday, I'll get you yeah, on yeah, Tuesday. Yeah, yeah. yeah. KG, I got the old. He, he walks through like the Avengers campus, like Cap's like asking him for shit, and he's like, "Look, I can't right now." Yeah, I got yeah. Tony's like, "Hey, man, we gotta go do the. You know, <laughs> hey, we gotta look at the Tass, that's got little dude, green. Yeah, Ultron. <laughs> Brilliant." Anyway, right. thank you very much. Guys, thank you so much for sending in your emails. As always, send them into hello at popkitchenpodcast.com. We love to read them out on the show. As always, we have more than we can read out, so we will try to get to them next week. But that's all. Let's move on to the games. As always, guys, we're going to end this episode with some games. I've got two rounds of games for you, James. Mm-hmm. Picking up on our miscellaneous rounds that we've been playing. Okay. So, James. Yes. The first round is this. Can you, in 30 seconds, name seven movies Mm -hmm. with numbers in the title, no sequels allowed? Okay. Go. 12 Angry Men. Yep. The Sixth Sense. Yep. Sixth Um, number, okay, whatever. uh, Seven. Yes. Um, The Taking of Pelham 123. Sure. Um, Let's do (laughs) Shrek 2. (laughs) Um, Let's go 12 Angry Men. You've said 12 that. Years you started with 12, uh, 12 Years a Slave. 12 Years a Slave. What? Is that a movie? <laughs> no. Three, two, <laughs> um, tell one. Me, what is it? Stop. Okay, first of all, first of all, you said 12 Angry Men twice. Doesn't count. I meant 12 six Years a Slave. Six isn't a number. It's not six. You could have said Seven Samurai, The Hateful Eight, Magnificent Seven, Two Weeks so, Notice. So, because it's like, spelt sixth. Yeah, but it's not a it number. Needs to be a- sixth is, is the, is yeah, the sixth it's, it's, of something. Yeah. yeah, you're right. You're right. Okay. Uh, you could have had... Thir- yeah, I mean, now, now is infinite days time. Of yeah, night. I could do 13 going on 30. We could go for it. <laughs> that would have been two, maybe. Yeah, yeah, that would have been two. Panama 1, 2, okay. 3. Taking the Panama yeah, 1, that's, that's so niche. Why is that? It's that's so one. niche. With John Travolta. Who else is in that? Uh, and I don't know, but it's a remake of a 70s film with the same name. Whew. Okay. Second round. Can you name, in 30 seconds, seven movies with a place in the title? Go. Okay. Paris, I Love You. Um, a New York Minute. <laughs> no, that's not a movie. <laughs> yeah, it is, with the uh, Olsen twins. R- really? <laughs> yeah. I sound correct. Made in Manhattan. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, Oklahoma. Uh, Mississippi uh, Burning. Yes. Um, uh, Sin City. No, it's not a real no. place. Um, v, uh, 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 Fear and Loading in Las Vegas. Yes. Um, so two seconds. more. Um, shit. Uh, let's go for... Uh, Time. <laughs> that's really hard. Sweet Home Alabama. Yeah. That's Chicago. Oh, yeah. That's good. Yeah. Um, from Russia with Love. Yeah, that would work. Um, London Has Fallen. Yeah. Leaving Las Vegas. I know you already did Las Vegas, but... Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and and more and beyond. I saw, I started thinking of like films with great locations. I'm like, maybe that's all films have locations. Yeah, all films get that out of your head. Yeah. And I'm like, well, that's four seconds gone. <laughs> anyway, loved it. Those were the two games I have for you this week, James. Thank you so much. The ring Guys, up. thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you've made it here, you're our biggest fans. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Pop Kitchen. Don't forget, we post new episodes of the show every single Wednesday. And guys, as you know, Check us out on Instagram and TikTok. We post clips, like them, share them, comment on them, Mm. spread them far and wide. And we put bonus clips out as well throughout the week. We talk about other things that we share across the feed. So check if you're listening to this on Spotify, check back on the feed in a couple of days' time. We might have more things. We're going to talk about a spoiler-free review of The Mandalorian Season 3. Because I think, you know, we talked about whether or not we should continue it. So if you haven't seen it yet and you want to know if you should, watch out for that on the feed that is coming. And as ever, thank you for listening. We really appreciate it. We really appreciate all your support and your emails and everything. So thank you very much. And we hope to join you next week. See you next week.